like to gamble, I tell you I get mad You win some, lose some, it's all the same to me This is Cardrunners.com Multi-Table Tournament Pro Matt Matros and what you're seeing here is a part two from a series I started where I was playing the main event of the most recent F-Tops and also the corresponding Sunday Million on Poker Stars. If you haven't seen part one of the series I suggest you watch that video first although you don't have to because all it does is show you how I got to this point the previous hour before this one so it's not vital or anything that you watch it first. It just might be more fun to see the first movie before you see the sequel. I don't know if you just caught the tournament lobbies there, but we're very deep in the stars. We're well into the money, and I have a little bit over average stack, so that's good news. Of course, average stack is smaller than 40 blind, so it's not like it's anything great. And over here on the F-tops, there's still quite a ways to go, quite a few players left, but I have almost twice the average chips, which is, of course, a very nice stack size, so hoping to keep that going for a while. And we're all still pretty deep here. I have, granted I have twice average, but I have about 80 blinds. So I have a lot of chips. There isn't really anyone else on my table except for Golfa, who's a very good tournament player and who I don't expect to tangle with much. Two to my right there who has, who I could really play a really big pot with. I guess this player, three to my left, has 15,000, so that's about 30 blinds, but, and then to spread the wealth up there with, who also has golf a cover. So there's the two really big stacks, and then everyone else is pretty short besides me. So, I don't expect any kind of major fireworks over on Phil Tilt. I'm just looking to kind of build my stack, attack the shorter stacks, and you can see this player with the big chips is limping a lot, so that's, at least he limped the first two hands, so that's gonna potentially lead to some a lot of small pots to the flop kind of situations. You can see over there on stars, uh, Golfa also on my stars table, um, and facing an all-in decision from the small blind, blind on blind. He just moved him in, and Golfa only has started the hand with about 10 blinds, so very reasonable for him to call there. But he doesn't call. You can see a small difference in the stats, the hold the manager stats on Golfa at the two tables. You can see in the 44 hands over on tilt, he's played. 21% of them VPIP, and over on stars, only 12%, and that could just be random chance in a small sample size, of course, but I think it's at least partially due to the fact that Golfa has a lot of chips on full tilt and can open more pots where his options are kind of limited with the short stack. So here a player opens for about two and a half times the blind, and I have two aces. I have a couple ways to play this hand, but with, a, with everyone being pretty short behind me, you can see that everyone had 20 blinds or fewer to start this hand. Um, it seemed pretty sensible to just move in and maybe even get called by the original Razor who only started the hand with 15 blinds. You would think if he's opening for two and a half, there's a pretty good chance he's going to play for his last 12 that he has there. Um, so I went for the straightforward play, which is just to move in. I think that's the right play for value here, and this is obviously just very lucky for me that someone else had two kings. With these kind of stack sizes especially, there's, there's just never a chance that we're, we're gonna not, we're not get, that we would not get the, all the money in the pot there. So, um, obviously that was uh, lucky for me. And I think the only, the only key thing to take away there is that because of the stack sizes, it didn't really make sense for me to, to do anything tricky. All it made sense for me to do was shove in and hope to get called because pe people were short enough that if they had committed some portion of their chips, you'd think that they would be willing to commit some more of them. Now here a very short stack moved in with ace-10 of spades, and I actually don't fault Golfa for getting in with king-8 offsuit there. The, the player with two and a half blinds that moved in can really have almost anything, and to get it in with king-8 against the price against what's almost a random hand is probably a pretty good play, but it doesn't work out for Golfa in this case. So over on tilt, I have an opening hand here, king, queen of diamonds. And uh, as I said, I had about I had about 80 blinds. Now the blinds have gone up, I have about 70, a little slightly less. And Golfa still has 100 blinds in the big blind, so definitely deep enough to play a sizable pot here. 
Goffa basically moves in for his three blinds on stars, leaving himself with less than one blind behind. And I get a, a small three bet here from Stake Sanchez on my right, very small, only 1,600 more. So that pretty much induces me to, to call, and then if I like the flop, I'm just going to get it in against his stack size for 1,600 more. Now this particular flop, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to check and fold. I don't actually remember how this hand played out, but yeah, that's that's pretty much what to do there. He's representing a pretty big hand, but I felt like there were enough hands it could have been that it made sense for me to play for 1600 to see the flop, and if there was a flop I liked, make an aggressive check raise all in. And uh, the downside, I think, is fairly limited. Of course, obviously, if he does have two aces and I flop a king or a queen, there's going to be a big downside. But in most cases, I'm just going to be able to get away from from bad flops for 1600 and then maybe hopefully get some folds after the flop if he has something like tens or jacks and I either flop a pair or flop a draw and he ends up having to fold because he doesn't like the overcards or something. So here a player moves in for 12 blinds and stars. I have an easy fold with queen seven. Eight seven offsuit on the small blind as, as the big stack until it limps again. Uh, Obviously, the big blind is short enough that I would move in here for seven blinds with this hand, especially since if you look at his stats, he's been very, very tight. V-pip is only eight. So that's uh, a pretty good spot if it folds to me to just shove the chips in. And, you know, hopefully I'll get the chance. Golfa chooses to limp behind the big stack on the button. I don't blame him. Seems like a good opportunity. Now, clearly, I can't call golf as all in for eight blinds here with eight seven offsuits, so that's going to be a fold. Sadly, I don't get a free flop on tilt either, and we'll see what the big stacks do. Three big stacks involved in the pot now on tilt, so they all have more than 100 blinds. A limp fold from the big stack, very strange play to, to limp fold in position for three blinds more. Golf, of course, calls. And you would expect a continuation bet in this flop. Golf's range is really big, and so... You would think the guy who raised with the small blind would see bet there, but he doesn't, which is a strange choice, and Golfa takes the free card behind him. I wouldn't expect Golfa to have that big of a hand here. He could have enough to call and when she's so see a showdown cheap. Now that this player in small blind is checked twice, I really think he has like ace king or ace queen, yeah. I, he does in fact have ace king, and it's possible I just remembered that hand from when this happened the first time, but it just seemed like the most likely hand for him to have a lot of players will raise with ace-king, and then if they don't flop anything, they'll immediately start checking and hope to take the pot, take the, get the show down for free, which is what happened there. Suited Jack, this is a pretty close decision, but because the small blind is so tight, I'm going to go ahead and try to steal here. I probably could have just shoved in on these guys and not given Mongoose the idea that he can move in on me, but the, the, the alternative, the other side of that argument is... Mongoose should know that if I open on the button and he only has 12 blinds, he doesn't have a lot of fold equity when he moves in. So I don't expect him to move in on him, on, move in on me there very light. And so he doesn't in this case, and it seems like the analysis was right. And of course, big part of the reason for opening is that the small blind is such a tight player. Here I decide to open in the next hand with 7-5 suited. Definitely not a guarantee, but again, when, when the button player is so tight... It's almost as if I'm on the button here instead of on the cutoff with the 7-5 suited. And of course I do have a hand that has some value. And we're not deep, but sort of deep with me having 54 blinds and the big blind having 37. So there was a little bit of playability to the stacks. And I felt like it was a good spot, A, both for steel equity and B, to have some speculative implied odds value if, in fact, the big blind didn't decide to call and see a flop. And again, I probably wouldn't have opened if I had an active button behind me, but because because I have a very conservative button player behind me, I felt like it was a good spot to open. Here, Mongoose opens for a quarter of his chips, and after he gets re-raised, you certainly would expect him to commit, and obviously he does with two sevens. I don't fault either player in this hand, the re-raiser or, or the initial raiser. Seems like they both played it well, and uh, Mongoose just flopped to his hand. And so he's going to win. I don't see much value in opening queen eight offsuit here. If it were just heads up with the big blind, I could of course just set him in as he only has about nine blinds total, even including the one he posted. But um, with two other players who have 
who have chips in between, and one of them has a re-raising stack, not to mention. The guy to my left has 20 blinds, which is a perfect stack size to re-raise all in, so there's really very little point in opening with a with a raggedy hand. And so I'm going to fold this 6-5 offsuit as well. You notice some of the some of my, my opponents don't have stats showing up on hold the manager. I set it to only show stats when there are when I have 30 hands on an opponent. Some of you know that from my earlier videos. Oh, I got moved to a new table on stars. Well, time to reevaluate everything. All those all that data on those opponents is going to disappear in a minute. But I don't like to be confused by a number that says maybe 75 or something because a guy played three of his first four hands. I'm going to think he's a total fish or something. Maybe he just got dealt three hands in his first four. So. I want to make sure that I'm looking at numbers that have at least some meaning. And I always try to pay attention to how many hands of data I have on people before I give too much credence to the numbers of, from Holden Manager. But at this new table, obviously I'm not going to start out by opening up with a, with a lousy hand until I have a better idea of what's going on. There's a very big stack in this small blind. He has 84 blinds. And I'm the second biggest stack. No, sorry, I'm the third biggest stack. There's another player with 61 blinds. So there's a, there's a ton of chips at this table. This table's going to be a real opportunity to gather some chips and really make try to make a run at this final table of this Sunday Million here. Meanwhile, on tilt, there's a short stack who only has about twice the size of the pot in his stack facing a bet on the flop. He really doesn't have enough chips to, to call and see what develops here especially since he could just get set in on the turn if he does that. So really his two choices here are all in or fold, and that's probably why he's taking so much time on the decision. And he does decide to move all in. And, uh, you know, I didn't see the preflop action, but with, with his stack size, I'm really not sure how he failed to get it in preflop with ace-queen. I'm assuming that there was just a raise and a call preflop, but the, what the action should have been was raise and then all in pre-flop with those two hands, and of course the jacks would have called, but that it's pretty inexcusable to not move in with ace-queen for 20 blinds when, when there's been a raise in front of you. And yes, checking the pre-flop action, it was in fact a raise from the jacks and a call from the ace-queen with 20 blinds, which is just terrible, really. Meanwhile, over on stars, there's been a raise from a player with 20 blinds and then a small re-raise, although a pretty standard size re-raise these days from the button player to about 7.8 blinds, exactly. And uh, the decision there was going to be to either stop and go or move in or fold. And the player chooses to fold. So I have a hand that I would probably play for all my chips here, ace-king, under the gun with a stack of the size of 52 blinds or 53 blinds. Obviously, depending on the action, I might find a way to not play it for all my chips. But in most circumstances, that's going to be a hand I will go with pre-flop with the stack size. So I got called from the button and the big blind, neither of whom is very likely to have a, a really strong range. So I would assume I would continuation bet here, hoping to pick up the pot a decent chunk of the time. So I bet half the pot, and the player who has a decent sized stack calls, and the other player folds. Nine of diamonds is a bad card for my range, and obviously a bad card for this hand, too. Player checks behind immediately, which is sort of strange. I'm still going to hope to see a showdown here. And uh, it's pretty much about what I thought he had. I th he might have, I might have expected him to bet with a pair of eights on the turn just to not give me any free cards. But I guess he didn't want to get um, knocked off his own draw because if he happened to be behind, he had six outs himself. So here's a small raise to 2.3 times the blind, and I have a little suited 6-4, which is certainly playable for me to defend the blind with. And it's not a great flop for this hand, so I could just check and fold here. I don't remember what I actually did. Yeah, the other option would be to make a small check raise representing a bigger hand and being pretty comfortable folding if the player moved in. But with no backdoor draws and just bottom pair, I mean, I'm not really calling with the 6-4 diamonds to flop the bottom pair. I'm calling because you can flop a flush draw or a straight draw, and those are, those are hands you can get more aggressive with your semi-bluffs. With. You can send me bluff with bottom pair too, but with the queen and ten on board makes it a little trickier. I'd be more inclined to send me bluff on like a nine seven four board than a queen ten four board. And more inclined to do it if I had a backdoor diamond jar or backdoor straight jar or something if there was a five out there or five and a seven. Obviously five and seven I'm open ended, but you understand what I'm saying. The the more ways I have to win 
without just having my opponent fold, the more more inclined I am to try the check raise. So it, it doesn't really cost me very much. I only I only spent you know 1.3 blinds to see the flop, and then I didn't get a flop I liked, so I just folded. Here a player is essentially all in on tilt for 11 blinds. Obviously I can't call with queen 5. I will get around to folding that hand, I'm sure. Yeah, there I go. All in on stars for five blinds. Pretty easy call with King Jack from the big blind. And obviously a good play from the small blind to move in for five blinds with Jack-10 suited. That's pretty automatic. But he's going to be out now. The, the guy who moved in for 11 blinds on tilt had a7 of diamonds. I think that's pretty close from where he was under the gun plus 2. It's kind of a borderline decision. I think with the antis out there, relatively big antis, anti of 75 for blinds of 300, 600, I think that's probably the right play, especially since people tend not to call as widely as they should. So I think that's a good... Uh, it was a good shove by the player with 11 blinds. Here I am on the button with a stealing hand, 7-4 suited. And a, here's a minimum raise, so I would expect that I'm going to make a small re-raise here and try to either play a pot in position or just win the, the pot outright. And sure enough, that's what I do. Looks like my hand's caught in the cookie jar a little bit here as a player with six blinds and the small blind. Decided to get it in. Now I almost hope the big stack moves in so I don't have to call another 500. On stars, I have a pretty big hand, ace-king. So this is a hand that I'm going to re-raise and commit to. I don't like putting in this much of my chips without moving all in, but I think it would be slightly too big to risk 430000 just to win the, the 50000 that was out there. I guess 54000 Well, I like that flop quite a bit. So I'm going to go ahead and bet clearly for value. And now I'm glad I didn't have to fold for 500 more and that the big stack didn't move in. And a new table on tilt. I just re-raised the last hand on stars, which makes me a little less inclined than I would normally be to open, but I just can't resist with the pair here. This is, might not be the best decision to try for the steal against the two big stacks in the blinds after I just re-raised the last hand because I know I have to fold to a re-raise and I don't like to have a ton of those kind of hands in my range in a situation where people are going to be suspicious of my actions. On the other hand, I also like to keep raising until someone stops me because who knows how long it's going to work before people actually give up. So here I did get re-raised, so I think my first instinct in this in this when I say first instinct, the first thing I said in this hindsight analysis was right, which is that that seems like a little loose hand to open with there, given what my image was at the time. If I had folded the last 20 hands, sure. But having just re-raised the previous hand and having all big stacks on the button, small blind and big blind, probably should have just passed that hand. It's kind of an interesting spot. There are not this many big stacks this late in a Sunday Million, and we have a ton of them at this table. So... The way, I, the way I look at that is as an opportunity to try to win the tournament, essentially. To try to get a huge stack and really put yourself in position to go to the final table with a good stack size. Queen Jack with five players behind me. It was going to be a borderline steal or not steal, but once there's an all-in, obviously I fold. I think that's probably a fold anyway, even with a relatively big ante of a, a quarter of a small blind. Brand new table, I usually like to fold a few hands first to try to establish at least the semblance of an image that I'm relatively, I don't want to say tight, but that I'm selective with my starting hands, which I am. I'm not opening seven dudes. I'm not opening randomly. I try to pick a range, and I either loosen it or tighten it for the situation, but I'm never just saying, okay, I'm raising with 100% of my hands. On the, I'm raising this next hand no matter what happens. I, some players do that, and it's, it's some people can do it really effectively, but that's just not 
my style. My style is more, okay, I'm going to be a little more loose than normal here. Where I would normally open, let's say, 30% of my hands from this seat, I'm going to open 40. Or where I would normally open 15 under the gun, I'm going to open 25 in this spot because people are playing a certain way. Or I would normally open 50 or 60% from the button, but in this particular situation, because the players behind me have restealing stacks or whatever, I'm only going to open 35 or 40. That's Those are the kinds of adjustments I make. I don't ever say, next hand I'm going to raise, no matter what two cards I have. That's, that's just not my game. Some people can do that effectively. I don't really know how to make that work with my style, so I don't do it. Raise under the gun in a call on tilt. The smaller stack has three times the pot in his stack. And he checked, and you expect a continuation bet from the under the gun player who has a much stronger range than the big blind. Sure enough, we get one. Big blind has several options here. He could raise all in, he could call, or obviously fold. Be be tough for him to do what he's doing, which is raise almost half his chips because with on that kind of a board you would assume he's pretty committed unless he's on a complete and total bluff. So I, I guess this part of his range could be like really big hands and also just absolutely nothing, like a seven offsuit, which you shouldn't have very often, I wouldn't think, but I would guess that's part of his range. And we'll see what the under the gun player decides to do. It's kind of a tough spot if he has like ace king or ace queen because it's it's hard to imagine on this 9-3 deuce 2 clubs board. And he's representing that he has like two pair or set or something, but it seems unlikely that he could have that too often. So uh, I can see why under the gun player was really thinking that over, especially since it wasn't that much more to call. It was almost priced in to try to call and turn an ace or king if that's what he had. And kind of a strange hand that played out there. I suspect that neither player actually had very much, and big bug small check rate just happened to work. I think the under the gun player might have had a hand before the flop, but didn't really flop anything to it. Here's a raise and a re-raise from two relatively big stacks. The first player had about 65 blinds, and the next player has had about 50 to start the hand. So fairly deep for these two players, and we do see a flop as the raiser defends. A weirdly sized continuation bet from the re-raiser is smaller than his re-raise was, and only about a third of the pot, and so the initial raiser calls either for the price or as a slow player or as a, on the draw, who knows. That's part of the problem with betting that small, is you have no idea why an opponent is calling you. But it works great if you get him to call one street and then fold the next street, which might be what he's trying to do. Now a much bigger size bet, more than half the pot on a paired board, on the turn. So it's almost like he's saying now, all right, now I really want you to fold. I want you to put in a little more money and then fold in the next street. Is what it looks like is happening. Of course, he doesn't get his wish. So his opponent moves in. And, uh, well, it was an interesting way that hand played out. I'm surprised the two jacks didn't just shove in pre-flop with that stack size. I mean, it's a pretty big hand there. I think if I had had two jacks and been re-raised there, I would have just shoved in and hoped for the best. And... Certainly after that small bet on the flop, I think that I would have raised if I had been the jacks, although I guess he was just waiting to try to get one more bet out of him. At that point, he was essentially slow playing. I'm not sure. But I don't really mind the a7 suit his play except for the bet sizing on the flop. I think he probably should have bet a little bit bigger or even just checked rather than make the small one-third of the pot bet reopening the action. And I think I think the bet on the turn was almost too big. I mean, it seemed like that's the kind of bet you would make to try to get someone to fold a hand and rather than try to extract value out of it. Now, obviously, the guy has an overpair. It's not going to matter how much you bet, but let's say he had two sixes or something. I'm not sure why you'd want to bet 10000 instead of, say, 5000 or 6000 on that turn card. But anyway, <coughs> so much for that hand. Over on stars, player with 20 blinds opens for 3 blinds, which is a big raise in this, this day and age of tournament poker. Most people are opening for less now, which is usually correct, in my opinion. I don't 
think I'm going to call on the button with Jack-10 offsuit, I say, as I see myself calling on the button with Jack-10 offsuit for the minimum raise. I hate folding my button, which I'm sure is why I called here, but I also hate offsuit cards, which is why I thought I was going to fold. So I'm not sure, having only been at this table for seven hands, why I decided to play here. I mean, I, I can guess why. It's because I hate folding my button, but... It seems it seems like I could have I should have just folded here against an early position min raise with this offsuit hand and waited for a different spot to get involved with gold mine. Once they check to me, I'm going to of course make a stab at it, and I get a small check raise from the blind, and maybe this is when I fold. Who knows? Yeah, good. Yeah, that's a hand I didn't need to be playing, and I think I just got a little anxious to play with an active player who had just won the previous pot and not fold my button, but I think that was a mistake. I should have just should have just let that one go and live to fight another hand without wasting the 5,000 or whatever it was I lost on that hand. Still in fine shape for the tournament. I'm not going to defend my blind over there on stars with 10-6 offsuit. And I decide not to go after gold mines blind with 7-4 suited in the hijack. It's probably the right move as well. Min raise on the button, which is a strange play because you would never expect gold mine to fold, I say, as he folds. So, kind of a weird dynamic at this table. Now, here a player is all in for f about 15, 14 blinds or so, and there's not much I can do with ace king. It's a pretty big hand in this spot, and I'm just going to make sure everyone knows not to play their two nines or two tens behind me, and I'm, the way I'm going to do that is just to move all in and isolate. And of course, someone might decide to call off their whole chips with something like that, but um, I definitely want to discourage it rather than encourage it. And luckily, I win the race against the pair of threes, and so pick up some more chips. Relatively easy call there. I mean, a player could easily be moving in, in under the gun for 14 blinds with ace, jack, or ace, queens, and it's pretty unlikely to be aces or kings, so ace, king does very well against the all-in range of the under-the-gun player there. Once in a while, it's going to be frustrating when they have pre like a pretty weak hand, like threes or fours, and they're actually favored over you. But sometimes they'll have a, a stronger hand, relatively speaking, against an opponent's range, like ace-queen, and you'll have it crushed. So you just have to get it in there with ace-king and hope for the best. So now I have about 63 blinds or so over on full tilt, about 64 blinds, and about 34 blinds on stars, which is pretty typical for very late in the tournament, very late in a, in a Sunday million. The stacks are not going to be that big. And the player who opened here started the hand with about 22 blinds, and he opened for a small raise. I think the play here is just to move in on him. I'm not, I don't remember what I did, but... It, I think that's what I would do, yes, and that is what I did do. It's a little bit of a high risk. I'm risking about 17000 to win. Oh, how much is out there? Twenty-one. About, I guess, after he opened, yeah, I'm, I guess it's not that big of a risk, actually. I'm risking 17000 to win about four or 5000 so that's actually a pretty solid risk-reward ratio. So yeah, I mean, I, I, if the hand as big as ace queen, any re-race is going to commit me to the pot against that player's stack size. So I think it's a pretty solid and clear play to just move in there with ace queen, and I'm glad that's what I did. Unlike with the jack ten hand, where I thought it was pretty clear to just fold, and instead I called in the button. Meanwhile, they're getting a lot of chips in here, blind on blind, over on poker stars. Yeah, as we play a limped pot over on full tilt, I make a loose call out of the small blind with king three, but with anties and a limped pot in the small blind, I'll call with almost anything. I trust myself not to mess it up too badly. And you see they both flopped two pairs, so big surprise they got it all in. And I'm not going to put any more money in the pot. And I trust myself after the flop to play almost anything for calling 400 when there's already 2,900 out there. I mean, getting seven and a half to one, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and see what the flop is and you know, trust myself not to go crazy if I flop a three or something. Meanwhile, two straight open limps for this player, so we'll see what he's, uh, what he's up to there and if there's a way we could take advantage of him having position on him. And same story as last hand. He open limps, the small blind limps, and the big blind raises. 
We'll see if it's the same result for him. It's a fold. Meanwhile, small raise in the button on stars wins the hand, and sure enough, he limp folds again. So I'm definitely not giving him credit for a hand when he's limping, having limp folded twice now. Something to note. Looks like it's been pretty tight in this table at stars. Hold the manager is going to come in pretty soon as I've played 28, now 29 hands there in the 30th hand. I should have data on all these guys. and It's looking like everyone's playing fairly tight. A lot of raise and then folds. A lot of folding to the blinds. Here's another one. Raise, everybody folds. So it's uh, It seems to be ripe for stealing. And if I get any kind of... So I'll just loosen my range, widen my range a little bit given how tight this table is playing. So now the small blind has about 30 blinds here. So this is a strange spot for me with ace-jack. I could move in, but that is kind of a big bet. So I decide to just call and use my position and see what happens. Here I get small re-raised after I open with 9-8 offsuit. I don't love giving up to such a small re-raise, but I don't want to play out of position with that hand either, and I don't want to gamble and move in, so I just fold over on full tilt. Meanwhile, I'm trying to get to... I was trying to get to showdown cheap on stars, but now the third heart comes. I want to protect my hand a little bit, so I take a swing at the pot. And this is a kind of hand where I can't really fade a check raise here, so I felt like I had to bet to not give any free cards in case he has one small heart or if he could just make a pair or something on the river. A lot of outs against me, but at the same... So I felt like I had to bet, but at the same time... I certainly can't fold the check raises. I really don't have much equity on that kind of a board with that hand. But luckily he folded and we were able to pick up the pot. Meanwhile, I have raised the guy who limp folded twice with King Jack. And we'll see if that ends up biting me. Of course it does. This is the time he's limp re-raising. So I think not much I could really do there. I think with King Jack... I'm trying to steal the blinds, and I'm not going to give much respect to the guy who's already limp folded twice, so um, I'll go ahead and try to steal, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, and of course it didn't that time, as he picked that time to have a hand, it looks like. But I'm right back at it next hand, opening with two sixes. And no one wants to play. If either of the blinds had moved in, I would have had kind of a close decision. The small blind moving in for 16 blinds, I probably would have had to call. The big blind moving in for 20 blinds, or 21 as it would have been, I probably would have had to let it go. But it was it was it would have been a close decision. 2-6 is not a great hand for me from that seat in terms of my own range. Certainly not the worst hand, but not a great hand. And the price would have been such that I think for to call 13 more blinds would have been the right price, but to call 17 wouldn't have been. But we're not going to know because I didn't really have a chance to think through the decision or see the action, and those kind of things will affect my read, but I th I th that's how I think it would have played out if that's how it had gone. So a raise to 3x from the hijack over on stars. I now have 30 blinds on stars, and I have 50 blinds on tilt. Thirty blinds, as those of you who watch my videos know, is a stack size where I don't like to do a lot of re-raising because it commits too much of my stack. So if I do re-raise, it'll usually be with either a very big hand or just total garbage that I don't mind folding, getting almost two to one if someone moves in on me. And I do like to call a lot and playing to check raise or just raise all in on flops with thirty blinds. And I like to open for the first raise to try to steal if I can, because if I have to let it go, then I still have say 25 or 23 blinds or whatever it's going to end up being if I lose the hand and then pretty soon I'm going to be in a good stack size to just re-raise all in. So I don't really mind just opening. If I steal the blinds, great. And if I don't, it's not that big a deal because my stack set might be higher EV for me in terms of, relatively speaking, chip for chip EV anyway. Just because it's easier to move in on someone if you have 20 blinds than if you have 30.
just a better risk reward ratio. Obviously, I have a monster hand here, blind on blind. I'm praying the guy re raises me. I just busted from the Borgata main event. I raised from the small blind, the big blind re raised, and I moved in with sixes, and he tanked and tanked and tanked, and he finally called with queens. And I, I tried to explain to him that, you know, he had the nuts. But, you know. Especially in brick and mortar tournaments, players are very afraid to go broke without the app literal nuts. So I make the continuation bet here to try to look make it look like I don't have anything. Obviously I have everything. Normally I would check a lot of turns here, but the king is a card that looks like it might have hit my range and I would be representing like if I had if I didn't have a if I had a bust hand, I might try to um bet that turn, making it look like I was representing a king. So to protect those bluffs, I'm also going to bet sometimes when I actually have a king, or in this case, much bigger than a king. So it looked like this player was just floating on the flop with a backdoor diamond draw and a backdoor straight draw, and picked up the straight draw on the turn, and you know worked out well for me. I can't really fault the way he played it that much. There's no way he should fold pre-flop, and it's not crazy to call on the flop as a float. I mean, he had some backdoor draws, and... He has a player who's aggressive enough that I could easily be check folding fairly often in the turn. It's really just a cold deck for him. Now, of course, he doesn't have to float the flop, but queen three deuce is not an especially scary board for my range. I mean, the queen could hit me, sure, but the three and the deuce are a pretty innocuous cards, so I don't really fault the way he played that hand, even though it looks like he played it. To some people, it might look like he played it really bad and got it in really bad. He actually mostly played the hand fine, I think. So the numbers have come in on stars, and I was right, man. These guys are playing tight. We got a VPIP 7, a VPIP 5, a VPIP 11, a 14. I'm at 14, which is very unusual for me. Of course, you've seen my hands. That definitely has not helped. Min raise in the button, which we've seen work before, and it works again. I, whatever raise you can, the smallest raise you can make and actually have it work is the raise you should make in most situations. I normally don't recommend a min raise in the button because usually people are not folding for that small of a raise, especially with antis, but it's worked twice against this gold mine player who's playing a very odd style, which those odd styles are very hard to deal with sometimes, and I don't, I really don't know what gold mine is thinking or what his plan is, so. Um, that's probably good for him. I mean, it's, it's tough to play against people who do that, and clearly he's doing something well as he's keeping me off balance, which is definitely a big part of the idea. So against this very tight player in this small blind, I'm going to go ahead and try to steal the blinds here. Obviously I'm going to fold to a re-raise, but on this tight table it's not an issue. So a nice little pick up there with a king deuce. Now, a little bit of an unknown and a bigger stacked player in the big blind here, which is why I don't try it again, or I wasn't going to try it again even without the under-the-gun raise with this ace-deuce. Meanwhile, on tilt, a player with, looks like, 20 blinds has gotten it all in, and they both have ace-king, so that's not very exciting, except when ace-king draws out on ace-king. It's a pretty bad beat. So the new stack sizes look like 73 blinds on tilt and still about 30, slightly less, on stars. So pretty deep on tilt and a couple other players are deep, two players deep in my table, and then most everyone else has medium stacks. Meanwhile, I have a monster hand over on stars, obviously, but at this tight table I don't expect a ton of action and I don't get any. Oh well. So it looked like a 3-bet and then a 4-bet and a fold over on Phil Tilt between the two other big stacks. So those guys have been playing a few pots with each other. And Akia, as you can see with a VPIP of 40, has been one of the more active players at the table. I'm still going to fold, I think, with A6 offsuit just because... Yeah, I, th I did think about it for a second there, but I really hate that hand a lot, especially out of position. There's not much good you can make. There's nothing much you can make with an A6 offsuit. There are very few flops 
you're going to like. And even against an aggressive player, I assume that his under the gun plus one range is relatively strong. So I don't, I don't want to play the pot out of position against him with relatively deep stacks. So I'll, I'll wait until my button or until he has a little bit weaker uh, range. So here's a raise in the button from a player with 43 blinds, and it's a pretty small raise, and I have a definitely a restealing kind of hand with two threes. So I'm going to go ahead and put in the third bet. I'll have a tough decision here. If he decides to four bet all in, I'll probably end up folding, but I'll be getting a decent price. So it's a, it would be a pretty tough spot, but I prefer doing this and trying to pick up the pot right now than trying to call and maybe see what develops and try to play out of position with a weird hand, because I definitely wouldn't want to play set or fold um, with with a hand like with a, with a small pair because I'm just going to be giving up way too often. So I felt like the the best way to try to win the pot was to try to pick it up right away, and luckily I did. And you can see how tight that player has been with a V pip of nine. So I think if he does if he does four bet all in there, I probably let the threes go, and then I'll say why didn't I just call and try to flop a set? But that's definitely not the way to go, calling and trying to flop a set, in my view. Definitely an opening hand on the button, and the other big stack doesn't want to play against me out of position, so I pick up the blinds. Early position raise, and I have 9-8 offsuit. Even though I like to call a lot from the blind with, with 30 blinds and try to set up a check raise all in on the flop, I don't like playing those offsuit connectors out of position, especially against a relatively early raiser, so I just let that one go. Now here's a min raise from a fairly tight player in late position, and this is the kind of hand where if I had a re-steal stack size, like if I had 300,000 instead of 440,000, I might just move in here and try to pick up the pot, but... I don't want to move in 440,000 trying to win 50. It's just too big of a risk for the reward, especially with a weak hand like Jack Six of Diamonds. So even though I suspect that Yuhu didn't have anything there, sadly there wasn't a whole lot I could do about it. Now here's an example where on the button, with the stack size that's good for calling, I'm definitely just going to call this opening raise of a little more than 2x with the two sevens and then see what develops, play the hand in position, if I flop a set, great, but that's not the only way I plan on being able to win the hand. So we'll see how the action develops. Now, if the small blind here moves in for 17 or 18 blinds or so, it'll be interesting to see how it develops. Jack-Jack two deuce is a relatively good flop for my hand. And so I don't expect, I don't imagine I will fold for the first bet here. And if he checks, I would think I would bet myself to avoid free cards. So he makes a small bet of about a little less than half the pot. So a couple choices there. I could raise, but if I raise, I'm pretty much committing to the hand. So I decide to take a look at the turn. And now we've built up a situation where I have about 1.75 times the size of the pot in my stack. And it's still a pretty good board for my hand. So this is, this is going to be a tricky kind of a situation here whether I want to commit or not. Now he makes a pretty big bet of 60% of the pot here. And so I probably don't want to call here and just give him any free cards. So th really my choices here are just to move all in or throw the hand away and give him credit for having a bigger pair. Now he's been a relatively active player, but he probably knows that I'm not the type of player that lays down a ton of hands. So for him to make this sec second barrel here I don't know. I think this is a very close decision, and I, obviously I thought about it for a long time. I think, yeah, I remember just folding and giving it up. I mean, in hindsight, you could say I was essentially playing that, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to re-raise with two kings and full tilt. Um, you could say I ended up playing it to flop a set or, or fold, basically, but that's not really what happened. There's a difference between flop, playing flop a single set or fold and, and doing what I did, which was call the first bet and see what he does on the turn. Firing the second barrel on a relatively big bet second barrel is more of a show of strength. And I still thought about moving in and seeing if he could maybe fold eights or nines, or maybe he actually had the best hand. I thought about moving in just now with the king nine of spades on stars, by the way, with my new stack size of 23 blinds, but I still thought that was a little bit too big to move in with king nine of spades there, and I decided to just wait a hand. I checked the turn on full tilt, planning to check raise, probably all in. Uh, I could say I'm a little below average on stars now with 189 players left. Um, I don't get the check raise all in on the turn on tilt, so I'm going to value bet the river. 
Pretty tight player in the big blind here on stars. I wouldn't be surprised if I try to steal this, especially since it would leave me with still a re-steal sack size if somebody makes me fold. But as it turns out, there's a raise in front of me, so I just let it go. Meanwhile, Akia probably has something like sevens himself in this hand, like I did in the hand against and over on stars, and he was thinking about it quite a while on the river. He decides to let it go. Certainly a good lay down on his part. Meanwhile, there's been a re-raise. Someone has put in quite a big chunk of their stack. Player with uh, only had about 16 blinds put in about 40% of his chips. So he looks pretty committed. This is a player who's only played uh, two of his hands so far out of the first 45. And now MC Legend, the small blind, four bets all in. So that's certainly a big hand. It probably includes Ace King in his range and probably two jacks, maybe even tens. That's, it's about the range I'll give him. It doesn't really matter. T Dan has to call here. I don't care what he has. Like he must have a pretty decent hand himself. Like unless he's, I don't even, I don't think there's any hand in his range he can fold here. Given that Ace King is probably in MC Legend's range. Meanwhile, I decide to call on the button against a small raise over on full tilt. I could have decided to re-raise there, which I think is in the current style that I'm playing. This this tournament happened about a month ago. I think if this hand had happened now, I probably would have made a small three bet and forced him to see if he wanted to play out of position against me with me having ace jack on the button. The way I played it then was to just take the flop and see the flop in position. If I don't like the flop, I just fold. No harm, no foul. I don't open there on the cutoff because the big blind with his 16.7 blinds has a re-steal sack size. And T. Dan really looks like he's thinking about folding. Yeah, that's a bad fold. It doesn't really matter what he had. That's a bad fold. MC Legend could could have Ace King there. And, uh, yeah, I just, um, I, I you can't put in 90 out of your out of your 240 and then fold. You just can't do it. Especially against an active player like MC Legend, who's had the highest VPIP on the entire table. I mean, that this is just not the way to play that hand. He says, felt like aces. Well, sure, it could have been aces, but you're not going to know unless you call. And you really want to know when you're getting that kind of a price. And now he has ten blinds, which, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it's it's really hard to win a tournament if you're if people know you're a player who will put in 40% of your chips and then fold. All in much better. Much better, T. Dan. And this is another situation. This player should really call, and he does eventually call with ace-10, and that's why you should call because of that exact scenario, basically. Well, T. Dan got what he deserved. He called to live, folded to live to fight another day, and then busted in the next hand, losing a flip. And, you you know, a lot of players will bust that way, and they will say, oh, I, can, I just can't win the flips. Well, that's true, but if you had more chips when the flip happens, maybe you, you wouldn't have to win every flip. And also, maybe you didn't have to flip the hand before. Maybe that felt like aces, but maybe it was ace-king and you had, you know, two jacks and you might have won that flip. Who knows? I don't actually know what T. Dan folded the last hand before. And maybe it was the craziest bluff ever and it was a good fold. And maybe he had 7-5 or, you know, something and decided to fold. In that case, it's a good fold. Here, this is a... I now have a stack size with with um, 17 blinds myself. That's a pretty easy re-steal stack size with an ace when the hijack opens small. So... I go ahead and re-steal all in, and luckily pick up the pot. So with the new blinds, now I have 21 blinds or so in my stack size, still a re-steal size. And I th I think I did think briefly about doing it with queen three offsuit there, but decided since I had just done it the hand before, and I had a little bit more chips now, making it a bigger risk, I was going to pass. And yeah, I remember thinking, oh good, this guy was doing it anyway. So maybe it would have been a good play, because I'm pretty sure this, this re-steal worked. Yeah, it did. So... Along the right lines, my thought process there to go after you who's min raised, but decided not to pull the trigger with the queen three offsuit for that many chips.
The raise and an all-in from a player with 18 blinds. Re-steal stack size over on full tilt. And sure enough, that works nicely. Now here's a raise and a small re-raise over on stars. We'll see what MC Legend has to say. Well, he's going to set Yuhu all in. Yuhu who re-raise to about uh, a sixth of his chips or so. So plenty of room to still fold if he was three betting a little light, which it certainly looks like he was since he's taking his time here. Feels like Yuhu has about ace queen, and he does let it go. MC Legend playing very well, by the way. Very impressed with how he's playing. Maybe I should just move in with those sevens. Not going to go after the big stacks blind with queen seven, of course, the most active player on the big blind. Continuation bet over on full tilt, and check raise all in. Nice stack size for that from out to plenty on the big blind. And that's a nice little pickup for to have that stack size to when you call the flop and then call pre flop and then check raise all in on the flop. You end up really boosting your stack size a lot without seeing a showdown. It's hard to do that. So that's a that's a nice little coup there for outs of plenty. And it looks like So Brow Boy is running into a hand over here from a short stack player. So he will double up Mahar. Go from ten blinds to twenty blinds in a hurry. And twenty blinds is where I'm at over on stars. Still a re-steal sack size, pretty deep on tilt. I have eighty nine blinds now and I have everyone covered. Two other players with 68 blinds. Everyone else has medium-ish stacks. Blaze still has a little bit of a re-steal sack size, although if he wins this hand, he's going to have he's going to almost be out of that kind of territory. And uh, so Brow moves in for his last six blinds. You would expect someone to call him. If not, he risks 117 and picks up 48, which is a monster hit. And sure enough, he does. That's why you should never give up when you get short in tournaments. At the Borgata main event I just played, a guy took a really bad beat, and we were yelling at him as he left, no, 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 you still have chips up. And, and he said, I don't care, and he walked away from the table, and he never came back. And he still had, like, 13 blinds, which is real solid equity in a major tournament. After This guy just, he, he took a bad beat, and he tilted, and he left the tournament, and let himself just get blinded out for his last 13 blinds. And that's crazy. Because dollar for dollar, you have more value out of those 13 blinds than you do when you have bigger stacks, I think just because it's easier to play them. You just move in and you can, you can realize more value on a dollar-for-dollar on a dollar scale. And even if you don't, I mean, even if that's not true, like I said, it doesn't matter. You still have way more equity by playing than not, of course. So just, it's very important to keep your focus and not do what that guy did and basically consider the new situation and say, okay, yes, I had a lot more chips before, but I still have this much money in play right now and it's got a decent amount of value. And so whatever the new situation is, make the best decision for that situation. And here I'm going to try to steal with the uh, ace-10 suited. And if, if the steal blows up, I still have a re-stealing sack size with 17 and a half blind, so I'm not too worried about the result either way. And I pick up the chips, and that's fine. And that's great, in fact. So it looks like we're going on break here. Uh, I know some people were asking for a, this part two of this video series, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. I think that's probably going to be it from these videos. I don't know how much time you guys want to spend on these two tournaments. I mean, I guess I could do a third video if you wanted, but uh, probably this will be the last one. We'll move on to some other stuff next time, but let me know if you have any thoughts in the, in the, co in the forums, and if you have any comments on what videos you'd like to see or stuff from this video. I know we didn't have quite as many super interesting spots in this in this video, but still some cool stuff happened, and I think some, some cool things got talked about, and uh, People wanted to see where this tournament was heading, so here I showed them, and I hope that was good. And uh, let me know what you want to see next, and I'll try to do my best to give it to you. This has been Matt Matros for CardRunners.com.